All right. I see. Okay. <laughs> The Visiting Artist Program, funded by PAPA's graduate program, brings an outstanding roster of local, national, and international artists to PAPA each semester for lectures, critiques, and workshops. This program exposes students and the public to a range of artistic approaches and fosters discussion around contemporary art and ideas. We would also like to thank PNC Arts Alive program for funding today's artist as well. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Brian Sanchez joining us. Born and raised in the Pacific Northwest in 1984, Sanchez began making art at an early age. Today, Brian currently works and lives in Seattle, Washington, practicing as a multidisciplinary visual artist with a focus in painting, photography, and sculpture. Sanchez's work explores abstraction through the stark interplays of shape, color, and contrast, creating dynamics of light and shadow, surface and space that compel attention. Whether in paint, photography, sculpture, or installation, Sanchez uses color as a means to communicate to his viewers. His vibrant palette creates a visual impact that awakens raw emotion and resonates with our inner state of being. Subtly or powerfully contrasting fields of color seemingly vibrate with intensity while, near, while nearby line sequences and compositional relationships draw the viewer inward. These works examine the complexities of human emotion by inviting, and by inviting a presentness and curiosity from us to surrender and truly experience color. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Brian Sanchez. And Brian, you may now begin sharing your screen. Let me quickly make you a co-host, apologies. All right. right. All right. Thank you very much. Ah. We can get started here. So I think. All right, can you guys see my screen now? Not yet. Not yet. There you go. There. OK. So I think we're in. So I'll kind of continue real quickly, just kind of on some bio information. Um, I work in the Soto neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. Uh, I've had a studio uh, there in that neighborhood now for about six years, currently uh, working in a body of work uh, that will be, that's exhibiting locally, uh, nationally, and I'll be doing my first international show this year in London. Uh, in the fall. Uh, so yeah, growing up, uh, I started making art pretty early on. My dad was a black and white photography teacher. Um, although we never talked about it, I was always around art. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I kind of built an intuitive sense to make art. I never really thought about it as a career or anything like that. I never had any uh, ambitions to do that when I got older. It was always just something that I could kind of escape in was drawing and sketchbooks and things like that. Um, my dad went back to college to get his master's degree and he took a painting class. And that's when I was first introduced to large-scale paintings, uh, mostly kind of reference from the abstract expressionist era. He was doing some Duchamp-esque sculptures as well uh, in his studio in the downstairs of our home. So uh, that was about 10 years old. And kind of from then on, I, I realized that it was possible uh, and I knew what the tools that I would need to make art someday at that scale. Uh, and then after high school, I went to the military. I was in the United States Navy for four years. And coincidentally, that's where I learned how to paint uh, in the hard edge technique that I, that I paint in now. Uh, I was painting murals and numbers and uh, different visual landing aid uh, signals and things like that on the flight deck of the USS George Washington. Uh, so I learned how to paint at a large scale 
kind of in an industrial way, in a really blue collar way. Um, and when I got out of the Navy, I was 24 years old and I went to art school. I studied at Cornish College of the Arts. And that's when I started to learn a lot more about art history and installation and sculpture and all of these different mediums that were available to me. Um, and I was kind of a late bloomer to college, so I didn't finish until I was probably, I think, 30, 30 years old. I'm 38 now. Um, so to start the slideshow, let's see. Uh, here's some photographs of the studio, and uh, kind of just to get an idea of kind of some of the ways that I work and the scale of the work before we go into uh, just pictures of paintings. Uh, they don't really resonate as much digitally as they do in person. Uh, that's a really kind of integral part of my work is uh, how to experience it in person. Uh, otherwise, digitally, it can kind of look like it was almost made on a computer or something. Uh, whereas in person, uh, they're typically, you know, uh, maybe about six feet tall. And uh, yeah, they kind of give off a different aura than they do digitally. And you can really feel the color and things like that. So here's some examples of the scale of the work. Uh, I think this frame that I'm propping up right now is a six foot by eight foot uh, stretcher. Uh, and in the background was a scale that I was working at at that time, which is about 60 inches by 48. So still fairly large works uh, getting ready for, I think this was my first kind of big solo exhibition here in Seattle. Uh, here's another image of just, just to kind of show the scale of some of the work that we'll be seeing soon. <clears throat> This is a couple of studies in the studio. Um, uh, while I was in college, I studied printmaking, uh, which kind of led to kind of appreciating paper and things like that. And when I started to focus more on painting, um, everything kind of starts on paper. So a lot of these paintings will never see the light of day as far as a large scale, but it's kind of how I get started color blocking and, and working with different shapes and forms and colors to kind of uh, build, build somewhat of a draft before a large scale work is created. Um, <clears throat> this is touching up a, a leather large scale work. I think this one's 74 by 54 inches. Um, yeah, nothing too special about this image, just kind of touching up one of the corners for a, for a gallery visit. Uh, here's a, a, a view of my older studio. This is a studio I had during the pandemic where this body of work, this newer body of work started um, just to kind of show the scale that had a really long kind of tunnel uh, feel to it. I'm in a studio now that has a much kind of uh, wider feel where you can see all the paintings at once uh, from different perspectives. Um, but as you can see, these, these works are really vibrant uh, and it shows a, a good example of the scale of the work and how the studio looks a little bit when there's things happening all at once. Another just studio image of prepping some work and showing the scale of some of the works before they go into their frames. Example of painting in the studio. I was set up with a nice stool and chair rotation where I'm constantly uh, <laughs> pushing, sliding one in and one out so that I can uh, reach the top and, and get to the bottom. Kind of an up close image of applying a cobalt pigment to a painting. We'll see this painting again soon. <clears throat> so uh, 
uh, <clears throat> I wanted to start off with some of the, the work that really influenced uh, the larger scale works that I'm making now. Um, <clears throat> I've worked in all sorts of ways. Currently, the work that I'm making is kind of a continuation of the hard edge painting movement um, and color field painting. Um, I use a special vinyl emulsion from France uh, that's highly pigmented, very rich in color. And I also make a lot of my own paint with powdered pigments and things like that. Um, so we can get started with some of the influences. Uh, Clifford Still was a big influence environmentally for me, his use of color, how every painting kind of became its own destination and its own experience. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to the Clifford Still Museum, but it's a pretty incredible experience to see these things in real life um, and the different colors. Just taking over portions of the gallery, kind of drawing you in. I think about this when I'm making and preparing for a gallery show, depending on the space, I'll always have a model uh, so I can see in from above, from every direction and see from side to side. Uh, I think the way that, that these shows are curated with only his work are really special um, because they get to uh, really work with each painting kind of like a different chapter in the, in the, in the book of Clifford Still's life's work. Uh, here's another example of, of his larger work and just showing the environmental aspects of it. Frank Stella, this is at Seattle Art Museum. Um, materials wise and technique wise, uh, I use a lot of references from Frank Stella as far as application. Uh, he grew up as a house painter, which is where he learned how to do his hard edge painting at this time in his career. Uh, and as far as color and taking it and actually making these shaped canvases and forms to kind of draw you in. Each one of these has an aura of its own. Uh, I find that a really special quality about his work. It heavily influenced the way that I work and using the raw canvas as a color, I thought was really interesting about his work as well. Also seeing the archival quality of the day glow paint that he uses, which is the vibrant colors, really influenced my work and showed me how that material would stand the test of time. This is Emerson Wolfler, LA artist. Um, his work was heavily influential to me. A lot of his collage work actually highly influenced the work that I'm making now the way that he blocked these silhouettes and these colors out and created compositions with them um, in kind of a more non-gestural way. They're very um, solid color fields, a lot of them, especially the ones to the left. Agnes Martin, huge influence on me the feel of these works, the softness and the gentleness and the meticulousness of them. Uh, each one is a destination and experience and it makes you feel. Some are sublime, some are inviting, some are warm, some are cool. Her work definitely heavily influenced me and the way that I think about making work today. Dorothy Hood was a huge influence on me as far as finding form through abstraction and creating that with color, using the color as light. Um, I found her book, The Color of Being, uh, a few years ago and became obsessed with her work and 
uh, really appreciate her view on abstraction. <clears throat> Morris Lewis, his explorations in color field painting had a big impact on me and the way that I think about color and the way of using it and the relationships between different colors. These are a few of his veil paintings uh, where I'm not sure if you're familiar, but he would thin the magna paint uh, with turpentine and, and drip these from these different racks and let it drip through the raw canvas. Obviously, Mark Rothko was a big influence on my work. Um, I like the idea that he really didn't consider color as much a part of his work as he did the way that they made you feel and kind of the emotional resonance that they had with the viewers and himself. Barnett Newman, uh, using the zips as a way to push and pull foreground and background had a huge influence on my work. Uh, the spatialness of these paintings, just kind of getting lost in the front and then being conflicted with, you know, just a slightly lighter red line on the far left with a bright white line that makes you feel like it's in the very front, but the center in the red could be the infiniteness. Another Barnett Newman. He called those lines zips. Those are really influential on uh, just how you can use color to break up space and create different sections and compositions within one painting. These are Kenneth Noland. These are called his flare work. Um, I like the idea of these, uh, the, the wall being the canvas and the, the, the form of the work being what breaks that. Environmentally, I think it's really powerful work. It had a heavily influence on me. Helen Frankenthaler, her use of color, composition, finding form with different color. Uh, Cartier Brisson, photographer. Uh, you'll see this is a very layered image. This border here that he's created through a hole in the wall with all of this information happening back here. Very influential on my work with the lines and the form and the contrast of the image. Alex Webb, another photographer. Uh, these images, just the play of uh, shadow, silhouette, light, dark, color, depth, had a major influence on the way that I think about painting. Uh, one thing I, I learned so much about painting through photography, I was a late bloomer to picking up a camera and shooting myself, but now I think of it as a tool to work with composition all the time. Uh, when I'm not in the studio, I can always be thinking visually outside of the studio. Another Alex Webb image. Uh, obviously, this is a play on light and dark and contrast and shadow, silhouette. Also, just the playfulness and the whimsicalness of the image. The, the mystery of the image was these types of images really influences the way I think about painting and photography. Robert Frank, this is an image from the Americans. Just an idea of how to abstract the figure. I like this idea of taking uh, what could be a somewhat normal scenario of just a person playing an instrument at a parade, uh, but the shapes, and the contrast of the image creates an abstract composition, also depicts the narrative of that time. 
Uh, William Eggleston is another person, a pioneer of color that really influenced my work uh, in the idea of line and spontaneity and color. Heavily influenced the way that I think about uh, creating images and making paintings. So now we can move on to some of the paintings. Uh, I'll do my best to describe the scale of the work. Uh, obviously they will appear like they're all the same size for the most part, but some of them are larger than others and some of them are small. This is a painting titled After Peak. This is the image in that photograph that I was standing on the small step stool painting. Uh, as you can see here, it looks like, like it could be a digital image, uh, but in real life, it's a large image that you almost feel like you could walk into. That's something that I was really focused on with this image particularly, was using as little information as possible, but to make a very complex image. Uh, with this painting especially, was thinking about background and foreground, the bright oranges and vermilion color appear to be the foreground, whereas the darker ultramarine and violet color and kind of the dark, dark aquamarine here in the on the bottom um, really feel like almost cave-like, whereas the blue lines are almost a backlight, as if you were looking into a forest at sunset and there was light coming through the trees. Um, I always wanna, in, when, I, when this is in the studio, I kinda wanna curl up back in this area and kind of hide out. And it, it, with as little information as possible, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven colors. Um, there's multiple different ways of viewing this. Uh, something that I'm particularly aware of in this body of work that I'm making currently is the idea of walking into the gallery and almost viewing this as a symbol of sorts, an abstraction, a form, that's how you see it. You see the dark first, which draws you in because you know that it's more complicated than that. And then when you arrive as the viewer and you're say four feet away from it, you're experiencing all of this in between and you're, you're seeing it from this angle over here and you're seeing it from over here, and it's a totally different experience from there on. Moving on, this is a dark image. Uh, this was actually created definitely thinking about forest and a way to uh, use colors from nature and landscape but also take on a figurative aspect by the ways that it kind of resembled to me almost like a cat-like figure here with this light, using the color as light to create line, to then create form. Um, you can't tell so much in this image here, but this ultramarine on this corner really, really lights up and creates almost like a, a glow or a vignette around the edge of the painting. This one's titled Get By. It is 40 inches by 30. So it's a somewhat medium sized image. Some of the images that I, or paintings that I'm creating, they won't function at a very large scale. Typically the larger, the scale, the less information it takes, which actually makes composing the image harder, to me at least. Um, 
some of the, the medium sized paintings I feel are more successful when uh, there's kind of more playfulness, more line, kind of more energy or action in the painting. Um, you can take it on a little bit more at this scale. If this were very large, you may not have the same effect or experience with the work. This is another large scale work. This one is uh, 64 by 48. It's titled Back Aft, uh, which is a reference to the back of a ship. Um, a lot of my work has titles and references to uh, naval history and ships and structures of that, just from my experience of the Navy. Uh, currently, some of this work is actually processing some of the trauma that I experienced while I was there. Uh, so these are kind of a depiction or maybe a frozen moment in time of uh, what trauma may have felt like. Uh, kind of reminds me of almost, maybe not this particular painting, uh, but the work that is in the same vein as this painting where um, if you're meditating and you close your eyes, you're trying to kind of find the unknown. Um, and when you close your eyes really hard, sometimes you'll, you'll see these bright colors and these dark colors and these different blues. And uh, for some reason, uh, these paintings that are referenced to the military, um, they always have that feeling of, of, of almost like a, a depiction of some sort of trauma. Um, not to go into too much detail, but uh, the very last deployment that I was on in the military, uh, my ship caught fire. Uh, so I have some, some PTSD from, from that experience. And some of these newer paintings uh, in my life, I'm kind of unraveling as a person and exploring uh, how to kind of grow around the grief and the trauma that I've experienced from that time. Um, and yeah, these, these paintings, especially this one, uh, reminds me of that kind of a processing of, of that time. Uh, very, you can, you can almost, you go back into it. And, it, and if you imagine this being almost as tall as myself, uh, you really feel an environmental element to these works. Uh, this is a painting called titled Night Latch. Um, this painting is 74 inches by 52 wide, 74 tall. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with this painting. It, currently, it's in the studio facing the wall with its back to everything else. So I don't know if it's going to go anywhere but it was just an experimentation of trying to figure out a way to use uh, the color yellow at a large scale, which it was complicated for me at the time. You can see the corner of after peak kind of peeking out the left corner here. This is a, um, this painting is another 40 by 30. Um, this one is titled Beam Line. Uh, you can see this bright violet here almost disappearing into this color. Is the, the, the name of it is 100 miles an hour. Um, I like the push pull element to this work. Uh, this violet really is forward whereas is the orange as well and the vermilion, whereas the center is a little bit more of a darker brick red uh, with these emerald green kind of poking out as the light behind it. Uh, but again, the idea of this work being somewhat of a symbol in a way to me, that's kind of how I see it. It draws you in in multiple ways where you have this high visibility color on these edges that create a splitting of the frame. I think about it 
also these images when I'm making them um, as if I were shooting typically between a 75 millimeter and a 200 millimeter focal length. They feel more documentational that way. Um, whereas if you were shooting with a wider focal length, there would be kind of more activity happening. This is a little bit more of a zoomed in feel, like a zoomed in to a larger picture, but we're unaware of what the outside looks like. There could be, you know, so much more information on this side and on this side, but what we're seeing is a cropped view of a larger, of a larger picture. This is a smaller work. Um, this work is 24 by 18. Um, this one was one that probably could function at a larger scale as well as a smaller scale. Um, earlier this year, I was dealing with some health issues and I had to work small for a couple of months. So I had a really good time kind of playing around with different palettes at that time and making some smaller work in the studio that I could work on flat versus uh, standing up for a long amount of time. This is an older image kind of when I was first kind of starting to explore hard edge painting again um, after years of photography and printmaking and working a little bit more gesturally, uh, kind of getting back into these solid works. This was in the beginning of that time. It was around 2017, 2018, when this painting was made, it was kind of one of the more, the, the first paintings that I started uh, working with the hard edge technique again and, and exploring color and their relationships. Uh, this one's titled Tear Baby. And it was part of an exhibition called Idle Urge at a gallery called Treason here in Seattle. And it was a part of a much larger body of work. I think there was a total of 18 paintings in that show. Um, and yeah, this one, it almost has, a feeling of like caverns or mountains to me, or this, how this color kind of opens it up as a pit. Um, kind of an idea as well of how to cut, compositionally cut through a vertical painting with horizontal lines and, and mark making. This one is uh, 64 or 64 by 48 in scale. This is another 40 by 30 image. And as you can see, there's this idea of kind of creating this symbol from afar. This one's titled Clunker. Um, as you can see, there's this blue that's coming forward and kind of pushing this to the back back. But this is actually also appearing forward because of this line here, which is giving this some depth. Um, most of these works do just have to do with that idea of color placement and how important it is. Uh, obviously, yellow and orange kind of has a more warm uh, connotation than a blue or a darker red. So this one kind of has a inviting feeling to it. But upon investigation, it has a little bit more darker of a narrative than some of the others. Uh, I like this one. Uh, just the idea of the form that it creates over here and then cutting through the center to create these different spaces. There's these different things happening, but they're at the same level. 
right here. And with these highlights here kind of accentuating this, when you see this in real life, uh, these, the color here, although it's a solid color field, it actually feels like it's warmer towards here and then it has a vignetting on the edges when in reality, these are just solid color. And this is an image titled Fallout. Uh, it is 64 by 48 inches. Uh, this is an older image created around the same time as that, the pink one titled Tear Baby. Uh, this one also is kind of exploring this high visibility color with these rich kind of more natural colors, um, giving off somewhat of a cavern feel or like uh, it almost has like the feeling of, of lava or something in, a, in somewhat of a, a cave or a cavern. Uh, again, kind of using this idea of exploring uh, kind of the basics of environmental forms and shapes to kind of make an abstract image. Again, this one feels like it could be shot at like a 200 millimeter focal length to me, thinking about the way that, that it's cropped. It's a, it's a portion of a much larger image to me. This one is titled, titled Catch Trap. Uh, this one definitely uh, is a smaller work. It is 24 by 30, I believe. Um, and this is just an exploration of working with blue, working with different shades of blue in it doesn't photograph great, but this is actually a much more vibrant. So this really comes forward as if you're looking down like a long passageway and there may be sun reflecting off water. And this is the color that it, that it may create. Uh, a catch trap is actually a naval term for when a aircraft lands on an aircraft carrier and catches the wire. Um, of the aircraft and it uh, it lands on board the ship. Um, and typically uh, when that's happening, you're really submerged in the blue of the sky and the blue of the ocean and the gray of the ship and these other industrial feeling colors. So this is definitely uh, heavily influenced uh, by the naval experience. It also somewhat resembles somewhat of kind of an anchor symbol or silhouette. Uh, not so much intentionally on this one, but it really it really does do that. This one is titled Layabout. Um, it's 64 inches by 48 inches. Um, this one really has an optical feel with that uh, kind of almost an op art reference. I'm not too interested in optical art, but um, this one does it with this relationship here, this tension that this bright red and this bright blue create it almost in real life it almost vibrates it's so intense that um, our eyes just cannot register uh, how intense that color relationship is um, this was a another image or painting that was created early I think this was a work that was made about four years ago in 2018 uh, this appears black, but it's actually a very rich, dark violet color. And this is an ultramarine. These are highly pigmented cell vinyl paints. 
Um, they're applied on raw canvas. So they almost appear velvety to the touch. Um, they're, they're so rich. Uh, yeah, they, they, these ones in particular can sometimes be difficult to look at. They're overstimulating. And that's definitely an intentional aspect of this work. It's very much has an energy to it. Um, and yeah, this is actually a deep, dark crimson over here rather than black. Whereas in this image, it's, it's difficult to tell um, what's what. One of the hardest things to do with these works especially is photographing them accurately. Most of the uh, color sensors and chips and digital cameras and phones cannot capture uh, the colors accurately because it is, it, it's creating that push pull so aggressively uh, with color that, that it just can't register. So this is the best quality image I could get of it. But in real life, it definitely is an experience. Almost, uh, it's been referred to as almost a of a sentient experience. So this is a more zoomed out. I would say this is, when I was thinking about making this painting, I was thinking from almost a 35 millimeter focal length. So this might be an example of a zoomed out version of, of these other paintings that we're, that we're seeing here. This one's much more environmental. This was before, I think this painting was made in 2017. Um, the scale of it is 64 by 48. And you'll see this is really exploring a lot of different color relationships. A lot of things happening here with line and color and shape and form, all kind of intermingling together. This, this was a very active painting. Um, it was a very short stint that I worked this way, but this was uh, the beginnings of how I'm working now. These were, particularly this one, was a segue into uh, kind of how I arrived at the place to make the current work that I'm making. And it is titled Died in the Wool. This painting is titled Turn In. Um, this was, a, I thought, a successful example of using different yellows to really accentuate this center area and create a spatial element. I think of these paintings almost as like curtains draping uh, with sunlight coming through the backside of them. Uh, something that I was, that I use as a reference was images of curtains at different times of day with sun or light coming through them and seeing the depth that it created and almost reversing it in this one where the blue is the light and the yellow is the high visibility that's coming forward. So the blue is the background and the yellow is the foreground creating somewhat of a spatial feeling down here. Uh, these definitely in real life have an energy to them the scale and the color and the richness of the, the pigments on the canvas, they definitely glow and have somewhat of an aura to them. This painting is titled Inner Circle. Um, this is an, another example of using these high visibility oranges to particularly in this one as well is 
definitely depicting somewhat of a visual concept of trauma. Um, it's a difficult one to put into words for me, especially because it's definitely, uh, I relate it more to feelings of, uh, and also somewhat of an education on how the brain works and responds to trauma and how our amygdalas are triggered and it triggers our nervous system and all of these different things. Um, this painting in particular revolves around uh, the idea of how trauma registers uh, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. <laughs> That's a little complicated. We could talk about that all day. Um, but that to me is what this one uh really speaks to it's titled inner circle so it definitely has to do with kind of uh, the relationship with your subconscious after experiencing trauma and what it might look like to hold on to that and uh kind of be processing it all the time and, and the influence that that has or the impact that has uh on your daily life uh until you find a place in time uh, where you can process it in a healthy way and uh, move forward. Um, also, another concept that I'm thinking about a lot in this body of work, especially, is uh, the brain is plastic. Um, these hardened, kind of rigid images uh, that depict trauma, they are malleable uh, and they can change over time. And as we age and mature and uh, open uh, with compassion, uh, these rigid images will eventually soften up and could potentially no longer be as, as hard and direct as they are currently. Uh, this is a painting titled Jack Roller. This one was definitely, this is a 36 by 48 in scale. So it's a medium sized painting. Uh, this was a way early on. I believe this was made in 2017 as well. Um, to explore a more figurative feel than the other images. Uh, you can see it almost has a figurative feel here almost like a helmet here with a face and an arm. This one is a smaller work that I was, uh, it's called Touch and Go. Touch and Go uh, is, I believe 24 by 18. So it's a much smaller work. I made this while I was uh, dealing with health issues and was working flat. Uh, this was working with a darker palette, these deep violets and dark blues and this kind of more sky blue. Uh, a touch and go is when an aircraft lands on the flight deck of, a, of an aircraft carrier and it touches and it doesn't catch the hook and it leaves and it has to go back around in a circle. I think it's two and a half mile radius to try and attempt to come back to land on it. Uh, this is a shot of two paintings that are installed in their, their owner's home. Uh, this was the only shot that I got of them side by side, but these were really kind of the same sequence of lines and shape, but almost inverted. Um, this one is titled Wander Path and this one is titled Dark Track. And they're both 96 by 72 in scale. So they're fairly large paintings and they're definitely environmental images where when you're standing, say here, you really feel like you can walk all the way back to this bar of color here. 
which is a deep crimson. And there's a color reaction happening here with this ultramarine that's right up against it, that's giving that feel of a backlit image, a backlit image at night, whereas maybe the sun is hitting these here, whereas water is hitting from behind here. And the opposite here, whereas the sun is coming from back here and this path here is where you go. This was a a custom canvas that was made for me uh, in a sh particular shape. This was for a very specific installation titled Energy Drink at a museum here in Seattle. Um, and yeah, it was just a way to explore a different shaped canvas. It's titled Middle Ground and it is 48 by 96 in scale. So it's about the size of a full sheet of plywood really. Um, yeah, and it's really just an experimentation of line and color and shape. This painting is titled Run Em Up. Uh, it's another painting that really is using colors from nature with kind of some more uh, man-made colors, which are these high visibility colors to kind of create an energy within. And it's titled Run Em Up because it almost can, it feels like it's almost leaving the page. Uh, it's a little bit more active than the rest of these works. Uh, and its scale is, 30 by 24, so it's a smaller to medium sized painting. This one's titled Buzzer. This one is definitely, you'll see here this color here and this, this line is raw canvas, kind of similar to those Frank Stella works that I showed you earlier. Uh, this was an example of how to just split this, split this composition with some horizontal kind of downward lines and forms to create a composition. Uh, this one was also part of energy drink. So it was a very site specific painting. Uh, its scale is 64 by 48. So it's a, a, a large work. Uh, this is a circle work. This was actually a commission that was based off of some other circles that I made, it's titled Stop Gap and it is six feet by six feet. So it's essentially six feet in diameter. Uh, you can see just all these different planks and lines kind of splitting this where it, as the blue is the backlight. And it's really just an exploration of playing with different colors and their relationships and side by side to create a narrative of each kind of uh, each line is just almost touching. There's lots of tension and playfulness in this painting. Uh, this painting is titled Giver. Uh, I made this painting. It, it had a, a more sensual feel to it than the rest. Um, it was a way to work with a more of a calm, cool pastel type palette. Um, and yeah, it, it felt somewhat intimate to me, uh, not romantic, but I don't know. The, there's two paintings in here that felt like they were about love um, and kind of the complexities of what love is. Uh, and this is one of them. Um, you'll see it, it definitely from afar, you'll see this kind of almost spade-like shape, kind of, kind, of, kind of reminds me of like a Richard Diebenkorn a little bit, his spades and clubs paintings. Uh, but yeah, you'll see this, this, this shape here, it's kind of more curvaceous on this side. But when you're really up close on it, you really feel all of these colors really just intermingling with one another. And it, it definitely has a, a more calm mood than the rest. 
this painting is titled Pulpit. It's a smaller painting. Um, I don't know. It just reminded me of a pulpit, like at some sort of a funeral or a ceremony where somebody might be standing behind it with reading something. It was a, this was almost like a study uh, that ended up becoming a painting. And you can see, especially in this painting, is the texture of the pigment and the, the vinyl emulsion on top of the raw canvas. And it builds up. There's three or four thin coats all built up and it soaks into the raw canvas. And you can really see all the texture of the canvas in this really rich way. Um, but another example of how using high visibility colors to kind of color block out a silhouette or a shape or a form to kind of create a narrative. Another example of just that, um, this one is titled Lynchpin. Uh, the idea that if you were to pull one element out of this, this whole thing could just kind of topple over. Uh, another one that was a smaller work when I wasn't feeling too hot and I had to work at a smaller scale. Uh, this one I believe is uh, 24 by 18 as well. And it's just a further exploration of kind of all these colors and lines and creating depth with the color and the blue is as kind of peering through as light and the light source being behind. This one is the second one that, that felt a little bit more intimate and sensual to me. This one is titled Enabler. Um, and this one definitely, uh, to me, felt like it articulated uh, complexities of uh, relationships um, with color. Uh, it has, it's a moody kind of cryptic painting. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about that. In, in real life, this, all of these sequences of colors together, you'll see this olive strip that just cuts through but it cuts in a really gentle way because of the way that it reacts with this blue and this, this blue violet up here. Just cutting, creating this area. This is the spatial, this is behind. It's these two things, kind of these, these two walls that are, that are just gently touching while they're also these lighter colors are creating this form. It almost has a, sculptural element to it. To me, it felt more sculptural than some of the others. This is an early on painting. Uh, this one is titled Stoker. Uh, it's a smaller painting. And uh, this painting particularly influenced a lot of the, uh, this idea of using this as a way to create and use some sort of symbology, this almost made up abstract symbology. Uh, yeah, this was one of the very first ones of that. So this was a, this was a gateway to some of the ones that we've been seeing that, that resemble this image here. Another circle, this one's a commission. Uh, same idea, just using these line sequences of color and seeing how the darker and the lighter colors can split through this circular composition. Circles are really hard to work with. Um, circles in particular, they, everything will look like an eyeball or some sort of planet. So I did whatever I could to not make that so. So just cutting right through in this really kind of harsh, rigid way, uh, but also using uh, a playful line sequences of color to kind of create activity and kind of everything's kind of reaching upward uh, and kind of almost traveling through the painting where this blue is kind of sending you back into it. Uh, this is some tall vertical commission that ended up being right over here by the space needle. These are in a big, uh, like a, it's a, 
some sort of a skyscraper out here. Uh, it's titled Glad Rigs, and it was just a, a way to use, uh, to split these, these, these vertical. They're also kind of more sensual feeling um, in imagery. You can't really see them very well from this angle. So here's a few images of some of the exhibitions. These are selected exhibitions of some of the newer body of work over the last four, four to six years uh, and kind of how they land and look in the gallery. Uh, when I'm creating an exhibition, like I said earlier, I'm using a model typically uh, to really capture that environmental feel. Um, I want the viewer to come into the gallery and be almost a little overwhelmed, but then slowly kind of be drawn in in whatever way that they are. It's almost magnetic where one painting will kind of be the starting point. Um, I did a study when I was in college where I put a bright red dot on a white piece of paper and laid it outside of my home. Uh, and then I watched the ants that would come and be attracted to this bright red orange spot right in the center of the page. I think about that as far as the viewers coming into a gallery, I want the color to really draw them in. And I find it really interesting conceptually which paintings draw in which type of person, you know? I think different personalities are drawn to different things. And I find that really interesting. That's kind of a behind the scenes uh, experiment that I pay attention to when I'm making work and then observing people experiencing the work in real life. Uh, also something to note, uh, when these paintings are finished, uh, I consider myself a viewer. Uh, I kind of separate myself from being the creator and I try to just let go and experience them as anyone else would. Um, that's kind of my take on, on all of this. I don't, uh, I don't get attached to the work that I make at all really. Um, I have the experience of making them and calling them finished. Uh, but once they reach that point, I very much detach from the work intentionally and uh, try to just become an observer and really welcome that curiosity that the colors create. Uh, this was a show in 2018. You'll see there's two circular works back in the back there and then these larger paintings. Um, there's that the one we saw earlier layabout. This show was really interesting. If I could go back in time, I would allow more space between the paintings. Uh, but I was pretty young at the time and I was kind of screaming at the top of a mountain. So I tried to jam pack as many paintings into this gallery as I could. Uh, there were 18 total paintings in this show. Here's the other angle of this same show. Um, yeah, you'll see these are all 48 by 60 in a row. Um, yeah. Again, more space would allow a different experience. I think now, if I were to go back in time, I am the type of person that learns from my mistakes. Uh, this was a, a show that was focused more on sculptural work that I was making at the time. It was a collaborative show uh, with another Seattle artist. Uh, her name is Abigail Doherty. And this right here, these two things are her work, these vitrines with the color. Uh, this was a kind of a ready-made uh, sculpture that I made for the gallery. This as well, this is a life graft. Uh, this is another standing sculpture that I made. You can see the reflection of uh, two paintings that were site specific back there. But this was really an exploration. Uh, her work involves light uh, and color, obviously. And my work 
uses those same elements, uh, light and color, but in the sense of painting. So we took those and used them in a more literal sense where we were using light and color to create an environment and an atmosphere. Um, there's a really interesting write-up on this show in Sculpture Magazine. And this is really the first exhibition that I did that really tapped into some of the more three-dimensional objects that I was interested in making. Uh, it allowed that opportunity and the platform to do that. Um, and I look forward to the future of building more, uh, not so much the lighting, that's a very one-off thing. I'll probably never light a show on my own. This is more an element of the collaborator, collaborator's work, but it was a way for us to merge our work together to create an environment. Uh, this was a 1900 square foot installation, top to bottom on the third gallery, in, in the third gallery on the third floor of a museum in Seattle called Museum of Museums. And this was their opening show. This is another angle. This shows uh, that, that painting that we, that I showed you earlier, middle ground in its home where it, where it resided uh, in the installation. Uh, this is a, actually a painting directly on a wall uh, with, and this is uh, a, a bed that was created by Abby. And this is a video installation over here. And then I actually created this architectural wall here and these benches over here. Uh, we wanted really hard to try and not use kind of the kitschiness of day glow paint and black light stuff. So we made sure to light these specific things up with white light, whereas the rest of the walls were saturated in color, almost uh, in like a James Terrell-esque feel, um, but obviously not. A little bit influenced by that type of work, but uh, totally different context. Another example, of uh, these walls and the bench and the reflection and using light and shadow, reflection and light color uh, to create an environment. You'll see there's a sculptural chair here with two large paintings um, of mine. These are each 64 by 48. Um, yeah, this one is titled Fear Center and this one is Buzzer that we looked at earlier. Uh, and this is where they lived in the exhibition before they went to their new homes afterwards. This is the very beginning. This is the very first show. Uh, it was titled In the Open Fold. This is just one corner of the room. And this is the very first show of work that I showed using this kind of newer adopted practice of hard edge painting, um, exploring color, the relationships of color, uh, working in these compositions of a more uh, kind of zoomed in focal length and kind of a zoomed out focal length. Um, and yeah, so this is the very first kind of up to bat of trying that out. And this was in, I believe, 2017. And I think that's it for uh, the slideshow. Awesome, Brian. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I do want to jump quickly into question and answers. We have about four minutes left and we have some good questions here. So I just want to jump right into it. Great. Um, our first one is from Jeff Shapiro and he would like to know why do you think that you apparently keep painting new designs? There are many easy answers to such a question, but could you go deeper? I repeatedly I repeat a particular form. Hold on, say that again. Um, from my understanding, he's he's asking um, why you keep making new designs or new shapes, um, and if you can expand upon that, and that he likes to repeat particular forms for particular reasons. Oh, he does, and why do I try and, and make I new? Yeah. Um, I, I think I think for me, I really think about the big picture. I think 
environmentally, I most of the paintings that I make, they have a home that they're going to, which is in a gallery. So they each have to have, they are a chapter in the book and the show is the book. That's kind of how I think about it. So each painting is a chapter, each painting has a different feel and to repeat the same thing over and over for me, um, I, it gets a little, uh, it gets a little bit too continuous. There's, there's, there, uh, if there's too much continuity and unity in the show, you, for me, it almost reminds me of like making a mixtape or something. You have a song that's a little bit high and then you have a song that's a little bit slow. And so that's what really how I think about it is I'm always thinking environmentally. I'm not just thinking while I'm making a painting, I'm very zoomed in. I'm very zoomed in on that macro, you know, that, 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 that one experience that I'm having. But then I know that it needs to kind of rebound or ricochet off of another image. And to make it the same, I don't want them all to fall into each other. I want each one to be a destination. So I make them differently, even though sometimes my brain does want to make the same thing over and over and over. So I do understand that perspective as well of uh, just kind of feeling that intuitive sense to, to continue trying to kind of hash out this one, this one thing, almost like Clifford still did. You know, it's almost like the same painting over and over and over and over with different colors and different ways that that they're breaking the composition in different ways that they're cropped, different orientation, things like that. Um, but again, the work that I showed today was really over the course of a handful of years. So what we're seeing, we are seeing some pretty drastically different images in that, in that sequence of time. So yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much the best that I can explain that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, with that, we are hitting the 1 p.m. point. So I oh. would like to thank everyone so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. And we are looking forward to seeing you, I believe, on April 13th for our next visiting artists. We might have one before that. I'm sorry. I'm speaking without my papers in front of me. But again, thank you so much for everyone that is here and I hope you have a lovely day and we will see you next time.